Let's talk about Pierre. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. Thank you so much for being here. In today's video, we're gonna talk about Pierre XO. I just need to disclaim this, like I do not know Pierre. I've never talked to him. I'm sure he's a lovely person in real life. And if he sees this, hi Pierre. No shade, complete observation, co completely my opinion, could be wrong. Very interested for you to correct me. But from my observation, Pierre has gone over the years through a journey of introspection, which I think is clear if you listen to the podcast or you see his videos, it's clear the man thinks about the why. How far he's gone, how deep he's gone, I think is more uh, clear now with the recent videos he's put out. And again, I don't watch every single video content creators put out. I usually just check in with people to see where they are in their journey. I think you like me are on this kind of channel, watching Pierre or watching Asneko or watching people who talk about philosophy because we want to ask why and we kind of want better answers than the bubbles of the world have given us. So I'm very excited to go over this with you today. Links down below for all of Pierre's stuff. Please tell him I said hi and please just like, you know, share some love, YouTuber to YouTuber. It's nice that we all live on this part of the internet where we can discuss ideas. Okay, here we go. YouTube is dying and why I'm probably leaving. It's been a while, hasn't it? That's right, it's me, your multidimensional flip lord, la 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 la, Pierre XO. And I know it's gonna sound like another cliche YouTuber doing a I got really burnt out type of a video, but I think this particular situation is a little different only because it's more of the current thing that social media and YouTube has become. Uh, I think these things have really affected the entire landscape of the internet, but more specifically what this video will entail is about my personal experience with YouTube and where I've been, I guess, spiritually or internally during my absence from it. Uh, YouTube has always been a favorite platform of mine ever since its conception. But it eventually became like a novel exchange of people's personalities and ideas and there was tons of funny shit happening all over the place and occasionally you'll come across something that kind of changes your perspective on things and it opens your mind to something bigger. And it was kind of like a giant playground and sometimes kids misbehave on the playground and that happens, you know? Remember the era of the prank videos where they definitely got too far, like, here's a Glock 9 in your motherfucking head. Oh, it's just a prank, bro, it's a fake gun. <laughs> and we, we, we remember those days. Uh, those days are long, long gone, in, even the good stuff, even the, the good stuff in terms of, you know, regular people or interesting people just sharing their own story and, you know, their perspective on the world. Because what it's now is basically what feels like a giant witch hunt. I don't know if I believe in these ideas that Ugi was better back in the day. I was around when YouTube was like first starting out. I remember having to apply for a partner program. I remember getting it. I also remember seeing the world around me change and people adapt and people branded better than I did while I was busy trying to kill myself, a lot of my friends and people that I was associated with found success on YouTube and then burnt out. And now I am back on this platform and I'm trying to be authentic and do my thing. But at the same time, like I'm an adult, like just grownups to grownups, guys, like, you know, this is only part of me, right? Like you must know that when I turn off the camera, I am being the other part of myself with my family or my friends. And this is like my chance to even perform. Honestly, I almost made this video in my gym clothes, but then I was like, oh, it's work, I should look presentable. And I put on this outfit real fast and that's why I kind of look disheveled. But in my head, I treat YouTube because it is like my job, because it is my job. You know what I mean? I know I primarily make, you know, money off YouTube, you know, through Patreon or through calls, but YouTube is my billboard. YouTube is my way to talk to the audience, to offer my time for free, to make it accessible to people, to make it clear to people that, Truly, considering my channel so controversial, I really obviously just love being here. But back in the day, I really thought there was like an authentic place on YouTube that existed, and it did, but it existed with individuals, not with really communities. And I think the illusion broke for me that YouTube wasn't a perfect place way long time ago because I was going to VidCons and socializing and meeting people. So I had a heartbreak over YouTube not being quote unquote authentic years ago. But I would actually argue it's not that it isn't authentic or that it's changed or now it's all about money. It's that it's about people and people, a majority of them want to make money and they want to brand and we live in a capitalistic world and they want to be good at that, you know, that way of living. I think ultimately the artists of YouTube are willing to take a hit, you know, for their fame or whatever, for their brandability because they want to be authentic. But I don't think there's less or more necessarily. I just think it's harder to weed it out, but not really. Because to be honest, what is the number one question I got on this channel? How do I find three, four, fives? How do I find people who are being introspective? 
you find them in libraries and holes on the internet and random Discord servers. P.S. Join our Discord server. It's amazing. And we're trying to have three, four, five conversations. We're trying to tell ourselves we recognize we're born into bubbles and cultures. How do we talk? How do we have com conversation outside of those bubbles while still acknowledging that they exist and acknowledging that we exist in them? You know, those conversations are very hard to have because they're very personal and they're going to force you to feel uncomfortable. So it's not that I don't dis like I don't disagree with Pierre, but I think depending on how you see YouTube, I see the Pierres and the Sneakos and the Cat Blacks and the Evie Lupines and the people who live on my side of the internet as people who are authentic and obviously taking a hit and obviously trying to be brandable but not trying to sell out. And we have taken a hit for it, obviously. Like how in the world how are we all associated with each other or with bigger YouTubers and yet we've never taken off? Why when ABBA reviews my channel does he say, Brittany has everything she needs to get bigger but the algorithm hasn't picked her up? Because... I have tried to only make videos about things I find interesting or only, re you know, react to certain things. And I'm realizing this is a fault of mine. By trying to be authentic, I have neglected my ability, future Britney's ability, to succeed in the way that she truly wants to succeed, which is by being rich enough to literally have a retreat center, by being able to own a place that people can congregate and have these discussions. That is not, it, it's not cheap to do that. So in order to do that, I have to exist on a platform that caters to a majority of people in a way that works with my values and allows me to remain authentic while still allowing me to be business Brittany. Because the truth is, is like, you want to talk about consent? The parasocial relationship that exists, the idea that when I turn off this camera, I change out of these clothes and all of a sudden I'm working out again or going downstairs or working on my next call. It's not, I'm not this person all the time, but YouTube creates an illusion that we are. So it, authenticity that Pierre and me and others were seeing at the start of YouTube sort of was authentic. But I think once the camera's on, a human knows what's up. You ever been at a get together with your family and your mom swings around with the camera and you're just like, ugh, mom. And then you like become moody or you're a teenager like I was and just like stared grumpily at the, the picture. I think we all do that. So I'm not sure that anyone was ever on YouTube in the most authentic way in the same way I am when I'm completely alone in my house but at the same time I don't think that's wrong or bad or limiting I think this is interesting that with all of Pierre's experience he has sort of a oh, YouTube's not a real place right now which tells me at this point in the video he's about a three let's keep watching to see if there's more to it perhaps um, a firing line of what other influencer can possibly say the wrong thing so we as an audience can crucify them. Before you think this whole thing's about cancel culture and stuff like that, I think it's actually a lot more than that. Like I said, I think everybody is kind of fatigued with social media at the moment. I know I am. Uh, I've really become incredibly disillusioned with social media as a whole, specifically YouTube, as something I thought was going to help people in terms of maybe <laughs> Uh, provide assistance in a lot of ways. Uh, you can teach a lot of people a lot of things and give them joy and, you know, laughs and humor, but also deeper connections. Um, it really doesn't feel like that anymore. It really just feels like sticking your hand in a wasp hive or a wasp nest, as they say. And I really don't feel comfortable presenting myself on the internet as much. And I'm sure you don't, you feel the same. And I'm sure I've talked to a lot of people who feel the same. I mean, the amount of people who private their Instagrams these days or just don't feel the need to post anymore. I mean, how many influencers did you watch before are completely gone? Oh, so many influencers, YouTubers or public figures don't even bother producing content anymore because it's not fun. Some content creators do not post anymore because for them it was no longer fun. But what I need to convey to you right now is that that was true for me before I reached what I call a five, right? Before I reached this Britney, literally while I was a four, I was saying, I'm out. Fuck YouTube. Fuck my stalker. Fuck everybody. Fuck the internet for canceling me. Like, fuck everybody. I was so angry. I was just, I just wanted to burn it all to the ground because I thought I had found a safe place. And the moment somebody, a specifically a stalker, who literally has like a dozen victims, specifically that person, because if that person put out a tweet, all of a sudden I'm a sex trafficker. And like the irony is I'm like, what? Like, how is that even the accusation? Like it was insane, right? But I couldn't defend myself. I didn't know how, not when I was fighting the stalker in the world. 
But now, since I took care of the stalker with the help of the amazing Westmost, and because I am at this point in my life where I have found the point of power within myself, and because I am able to make peace and forgive everybody to the point where I wish my stalker the best, I hope she grows and learns, and I hope she becomes a better person. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be in with me involved. You know, I can say, I hope you are a better person while still keeping my distance. I'm open, but I have boundaries. And with her, I have huge boundaries. She's still a human on this planet it right and I don't want her to suffer any more than she has but I don't also want her to cause suffering so when I think about YouTube and what it's brought me yes it's brought me so much fucking pain and shallow relationships and friendships that ended horribly I cannot tell you how fucking petty queer side of YouTube is and how many lesbians I've been to their homes and they are drama queens girls I walked into this house and the first thing this lesbian says to me is just how shitty all her friends are and I'm like wow you talk shit on your friends to a person you've just met must not be good friends. And she's like, well, you know the gays. We're all about drama. I was like, yeah, but my my friends and I are loyal, ride or die, bitch. Like the way you talk about your homies makes me think you can't be trusted. And she couldn't. She literally exposed herself to me in so many different ways. And there's so many of them online. And there are these people that I was like invested emotionally in because I was like, this is amazing. They want to hang out with me. They like my content. So oh my God, we can talk about nothing. Oh my God, they're such shallow thinkers. Oh my God, what is this? This is life. Humans are gonna human. There is no place on earth that is without drama and without shallowness. There is no place on earth that exists of and has human beings in it and which there is not conflict. Our diversity, our differences cause the chaos that everyone seems to hate. But that is the conflict we have all within inside, in, inside of us, evolutionarily speaking, religiously speaking, culturally. We exist in bubbles and we can decide how diverse those bubbles are. But that's why people have Mormon towns and queer towns and certain areas that are for our people. Because we know that separation sometimes works, but not so much segregation, right? We want the freedom to go where we want and we want the freedom to start the neighborhoods we want, but we don't want people coming into our neighborhoods and hurting us or killing us or being prejudiced towards us in a way that's really harmful. We want cohesive existing, but what does that look like? And what is what is the thing inside Pierre that's crushing right now for him? It's the realization that the place he thought was safe isn't. The place he thought he would be forever is exhausting. And that is a painful realization, but honestly, can I be real? Once I went through this transformation, girl, YouTube's so easy now. Life's so easy now. Because now I know why I believe the things I believe. I just didn't know before. I thought I knew why I believed the things I did, but I didn't. So now I can get on the internet and I'm pretty, I mean, I'm so damn confident that I'm pretty sure there's no, no one I could not talk to and feel pretty damn confident about my ideas versus before I was like, oh my God, what would I do if this person talked to me or this person? It doesn't matter now. Now I look at every single one of us as like real individuals, genuine like energies in the universe, and I acknowledge I'm going to die. Knowing I'm going to die is like such a life-changing thing. You know me, suicide my whole life, playing with killing myself, doing all these things throughout my whole life, never respected death until recently. Never really respected it. Had a lover relationship with it. Definitely saw him on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Definitely entangled myself in her negative energy, but I never respected death until recently. Introspection leads you to a conclusion. I believe that humans are simply going to human and one must make peace with that before one can change anything about that that they don't like. It's it's risking your mental sanity. Uh, there's so many consequences with putting yourself out there now that it completely overrides the possible benefits. Um, as somebody who has both benefited quite a lot but also have seen the dark side of being on the internet. Uh, I have some pretty mixed reactions, but at this current stage, I think it's way more negative than it really is positive. One of the common things is, look, you can make a living off of doing what you love and people from around the world know you, you're kind of famous and you've helped out a lot of people. I am all for helping people out. That's probably the most important out of all of it. And I would love to make a living and I am very fortunate to get to a point where I can. But uh, when I look back to my start, one of the biggest things that kind of put me on the map was, you know, the infamous Jubilee video, you know, you know, um, long story short, uh, I exposed a more intimate side of myself with somebody that I was seeing at the moment, and it kind of just made waves. It's I think it's sitting past almost it's almost at 7 million views or some crazy. I'm sorry, just pause right here. 533 Future Brittany. 
that I forgot about this version of Pierre. I've seen this video, but I totally forgot. There was a version of Pierre that would go on a Jubilee video. Now, I need you to take into consideration, like, who I am in relation to the bubbles of the world. I just feel like I would be, I'd be like that kid in school that I was. In school, I would, like, raise my hand during tests, and I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't like this. Something feels weird. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I just feel like you're trying to trick me on this paper. And she's like, well, I mean, the questions are there to challenge you. But the questions were bullshit. The same way I feel about these kinds of videos, like Jubilee and stuff, I feel like people are trying... And they're genuine twos enjoying their little like experiments, maybe some threes. But in general, it never felt like something I wanted or needed to do because it, it felt performative in a way that I was like, this feels fake. And it made me uncomfortable. Now, not all Jubilee videos. I don't even think any of them are really fake, like staged. But I think it's hard for me not to know that there's a specific energy to these videos. I asked her if she loves you. Did you know her? I said no. Was it a yes? I mean, should I really answer him? <laughs> I'm Pierre XO, I'm 24. I'm Stephanie Van Berg. I am 43 years old. And if I could describe our relationship, it's fiery. Rock, paper, scissors. Oh my god, what's that? You don't know that? <laughs> She's from Europe. Uh, like any uh, couple of this digital world, we met through social media, uh, specifically IG, Instagram. You actually slid into my DMs and uh, you messaged me about my voice. Well, basically, he liked a few of my pictures. <laughs> I, I went on his profile and I got very interested and I started liking and I started like watching his videos, what he's doing, and I've been really caught with his voice. And I just messaged him and I, I told him that he had an amazing voice and we started talking like that. <laughs> I was like, okay, supermodel. She looks fairly interesting. Um, I think we could get along. You're, you're also slightly intimidating as well. You no. still are, actually. You, you are you still, kidding me? Look at that. Oh <laughs> my god! <laughs> really? I mean, a little bit. No way. Oh, come on. You're oh. like a supermodel. You're like a Swiss supermodel. You're a like rock half your, star. Half your pictures of you are like <laughs> half naked. I would describe our relationship as like like a volcano, just in, in Mount Vesuvius, just like, like just boiling underneath a saute pan. Okay, he's like at the pizza, and I'm like, the fire. Yeah, I mean, it's super passionate, it's super, I don't know. What I can, what I can say, it's super intense, passionate. So are y'all married? Are you friends? Are you friends with benefits? Like, what's the relationship? This is a good question, actually. So uh, we actually had an argument, and um, where I stand is that I don't really know exactly, and I kind of prefer it that way. Our relationship is like the perfect representation of like a digital postmodern world where there are absolutely no labels, no gender, and no age or like anything to define what the hell we're experiencing in this short amount of three months. And if I could find a label to describe what the hell just happened, it would be nearly impossible. He's my boyfriend. No. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He knows that, but he doesn't want it. But the thing is, like, I don't fear any word and I don't fear any problems, like, regarding a relationship. He fears these kind of things. So for me, this is, like, a normal thing. So this guy is my boyfriend. Yes, I want to see him when I have free time. I don't want to see another one. Well, I'd like to go with the labelless route. I like to, to think that we're just doing what we're doing mm -hmm. and we're having fun doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's too soon to say whether we are boyfriend or girlfriend or not, but I do, th I do enjoy the time we spend together and I think it's important too. Yeah, it's very important. I agree. I know. You know, it's another... I know. It's fine. I know everything about that. And so then it requires a specific kind of person who holds that energy. I wonder if Pierre would go on Jubilee again now because I wonder if he'd be able to sit through, like have we not seen enough like cut slash Jubilee videos to know there is a sense that some of them are trying really hard to be deep, but they're still asking basic questions. It's no judgment towards Jubilee, like truly no judgment. But I, I think we watch it not because we're getting enlightened. We watch these things because we're 
entertained. It was amazing at the moment. I was a bit younger, 23, 24 or something like that. And it was amazing to finally be noticed in general. But not only that, to be noticed for something that uh, would feel like being in the entertainment industry or being creative. So it gave me a kickstart to be uh, more publicly seen. And I loved every second of it. Oh my God, the attention at the time was like, oh, finally, people somewhat care, or at least they want to see me. And then everybody, you know, kind of uh, put me on a pedestal, more like a minority put me on a pedestal. But the other half, which is the dark side, was that a large majority hated me. Uh, this is where the Flip Lord variant came from. Flip Lord is actually a play on fuck boy because everybody thought I was a fuck boy when that came out. And I disagree because um, I was just trying to lay boundaries, yada, yada, yada. I made a whole 40 minute video explaining the situation. But let's just say that brought a lot of drama in my life. But it was a type of drama that I was okay with because there, I don't think there was much else happening. And I have just appreciated that something was happening overall. This is it. So this is the key. So again, no judgment, but I just want to give you context. I'm a YouTuber. Pierre's a YouTuber. The difference between him and I is that I was getting so much attention when I was younger because I was queer and I was coming out and I was the first girl in our family to come out and everybody knew about it and it was a very big deal because we're Chaldean. It was like a bit, you know what I mean? And I think when I joined YouTube, I, I wanted less attention and more I wanted to be seen. So I very much distinguish attention from being seen, but some YouTubers, and maybe this was younger Pierre's, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. maybe that was his disconnect, is that he thought attention equaled being seen. And so maybe that was the issue, but it sounds like he's self-aware enough to know that all attention was good attention, including negative attention versus me moving forward on YouTube. I was, I wanted to say what I wanted to say, but any time I got like mini canceled or people were mad at me when I was starting out, I usually took videos down. I usually doubled down. I usually took videos down. I usually argued, but I usually gave up. I did cater to the audience. I mean, I still do, but I think out of respect for our our lack of connectiveness. I think now I censor myself slightly with the world because I don't think the world earns it or has earned me, but also I don't think it's appropriate. YouTube's, you know, YouTube has a platform there's a space here that's shared. I think my channel is mine. And if you're on it, you should just be forewarned that you're going to have moments of discomfort with my content. But I don't go on other people's content and bother them. I don't dislike videos traditionally. Like I can't even remember the last time I did. The point is, is that how you interact with YouTube is going to be dependent on your needs and your past trauma. So Pierre is self-aware here. I can see a person who's really thinking about why he did things. But there's something in his tone that makes me makes me know he's more of a three than like a five as an example, because he's still bitter, bitter. Could be a four, let's see, let's keep watching it. And uh, because the whole thing started from controversy, basically, or started from drama, it kind of trained me to realize that obviously drama gets attention and attention breeds viewership and money. And I unconsciously associated the two. And I think every public figure celebrity influencer knows this that's why they almost intentionally do controversial things this is what i mean when i say everyone has to go on their own journey at their own t in their own time i started youtube when i was like 19 and my dad was so excited and everybody was so excited but we went into youtube knowing it was brandable i was like i wasn't it was like 2008 9 i started youtube there even i think because i grew up with a family that was like and we are an immigrant family, but we are also connected to like Catholic celebrities or Catholic people. I, from a young age, was exposed to what it's like to talk to famous people or how to have a brand. And so I couldn't go into YouTube naive. Like I couldn't go into YouTube saying the subconscious led me to attach myself to drama. I knew at 18, 19, I knew as a teenager, I was calling into Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and meeting Glenn Beck and meeting all these people. I knew I couldn't be ignorant. Versus Pierre, he's saying as a young person, he was subconsciously trained to seek out negativity for views. I knew I wasn't allowed to because my values wouldn't let me. Even when I tried to do clickbait, it was so bad. It was obvious I wasn't, I didn't know how to be brandable. You remember when Dan Brown was on YouTube, right? Regardless of one's political orientation or proclaimed views on abortion, you would be hard pressed to find anyone who thinks that having an abortion is cause for celebration. D, E, A, D, F, E, T, U, S, E, S, dead fetuses, dead fetuses, yay! 
As much as Rush Limbaugh might want you to think that that's what pro-choicers are like, that is not what pro-choicers are like. I love abortion. I remember loving his content and thinking, I want to make content like him, but I just, for the life of me, couldn't become brandable. I just didn't know how to make a uniform that I was comfortable playing on the internet because I knew it would end. I remember when I was in, um, I did promos for talk radio. Remember I've told you this story, guys. They really want you to pick a, a niche, a shtick, and stick to it. Do not deviate from the brand that you've created about yourself. And I can't do that. I'm way too introspective, way too nomadic. I'm not that human. But now the reason I found a brandable look for my for my YouTube is because I got off of it, had a midlife crisis, went through an ego death or 20, had a life changing experience, reached what I call enlightenment, inner peace. And now I'm like, oh, well, shoot, I could have done it this way the whole time, but I couldn't have because I didn't have the knowledge. But please listen to the way Pierre speaks. He did really well on YouTube for himself. He really did utilize that drama and the negativity. But because of how I was raised, I already knew not to do that. But it would frustrate me, truly frustrate me in my beginning years of YouTube where I was like, fuck, what do I do? How do I survive here? And the truth is, is that I wouldn't know how to for 10 whole years. For 10 years, for thousands of videos, I'd be just basically never, never making anything of myself. And now I finally have a stable career and great income and all these things branded around acknowledging our past selves and trying to get better. And I had to go through that 20s. I had to be a mess just like Pierre is. But isn't that interesting? You guys always ask me about the levels and you say, you know, can you be a young person and be a three, four, five? Yes, you can be an old person, a young person. But the point is, is your life has to force you to self-examine. And you might be wondering, how did Pierre go all of this time on YouTube? He's 28. How do you go all those years on YouTube and not know better? Because he didn't. In the same way most of us don't. But that's why I think we should hold newer generations even more accountable than older generations. You want to hold older generations accountable because they're old? And I'm saying, no, old can breed stagnation because they're in bubbles. And young people are getting the freshest new information. So if anything, they should be held more accountable. But we can't because they're young and their brains aren't fully developed. We are all at a disadvantage. Unless you are actively staying conscious, unless you are actively studying and updating yourself, you will fall behind. I fall behind every day with lingo and what the teens are doing. I have no idea what you're doing. If you are under 25, 22, if you're under 22, I have no idea what you're doing. I have no idea what the trends are. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be, like what kids are wearing. And that is a, that is a limitation for me, but I don't need it because my job is catered to older people anyways, or people who are asking why and major popular society doesn't give a fuck. Pierre himself, when he was on YouTube as a younger person, obviously only gave so much of a fuck. I don't even know if he gave any any of a fuck because he was open to inviting negative energy into his life. At that point, I was like experimenting with different ideas, perhaps more intellectual videos, social commentary, philosophical videos, blah, 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 blah. But nothing really hit that hard compared to drama. And my compromise was, look, I'm not into drama. I really actually never cared about the drama, but I will do the research and cover these topics and then implement some possible sociological explanations, psychological explanations, philosophical commentary about a so-called petty pop cultural controversy. And it worked for a little bit. Uh, it worked for a bit. And it was not really fulfilling, but at least I was able to kind of do what I sort of wanted while being able to make a living. And then the good old thing happened. You know, the thing when the world flipped, I realized flip Lord didn't have to mean fuck boy anymore because the world is entirely flipped. And I feel like living a life that's against that would make you a flip Lord in all senses. So the whole world shut down. Everything changed overnight. I mean, absolutely everything. Businesses, the political landscape, your the, the friends and your family around you. Obviously, in exchange for all that, the internet itself, everybody started behaving really differently. Everything became hyper-politicized. Everything became about a, a social movement. There was this like really crazy, intense hysteria that just ramped up overall. And this whole idea of canceling ramped up around the time. And then um, what used to be interesting, you know, insightful videos and possible prank videos that got attention 
were actually mostly controversy or drama videos that basically flooded the entire uh, landscape of YouTube. And I'm definitely someone guilty of riding that wave as well. So at the time, I looked up at, at any controversy that happened, which was everything all the time. And I decided to cover these issues. And my attempt was to try to perhaps bring an opposing view, or let's just say a more nuanced, objective, neutral, balanced view to a lot of these events. Some events were obviously just super bad. They were just so obviously bad that like you couldn't take a objective, neutral view. But most of it was, uh, I was, I was attempting to. The entire world of YouTube and social media changed because everything was about controversy and drama, but because of the international or global crisis, these news channels and whatever channels just only covered this crisis all the time. People dying, people dying, people dying, people are getting hurt. Okay, what are we going to do about it? We put a hashtag, hashtag this, hashtag that, hashtag this. We're going to save each other and no one got saved. Sorry to say, but at this point, I think we can kind of de de determine that a lot of these hashtags and a lot of this approach to things isn't as effective as, a, as we thought it would be. I'm sorry. <clears throat> no. OK. The only people that thought the hashtags would be effective or efficient in moving uh, people forward were people who were trying to brand activism, which is true. You got to get people on board and make it look cool. But they always fucking fail at that. Or two, people who wanted to connect because of the hashtag. So, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on social media. You guys know that. But, you know, I spend about five to ten minutes a day on Twitter every day. And I just go and I look at the, like, hashtags, what's trending, what's going on. And then I go click on a hashtag. And it's usually people from both sides arguing with each other under the same hashtag, whether it's activism or not. Like, they are trying to just be heard and seen by the people using that hashtag. So I think it's hard to weed out organic um, organizations who are here to help people when even our charities and organizations that we've set up in this country are really bad at accomplishing their goals. They're kind of great. I'm not trying to shit on everybody that's worked hard or helped people. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that there's something, there's a facade that exists within even our own organizations that I think helps per, helps facilitate that continuing bubble like I remember my mom a while back during these years was talking about how Catholic churches are being shot up and do you know their people people are attacking Catholic churches and I was like who are these people what are what's happening and it was during the times when white people were shooting up black churches and I was like well how many are happening and who's doing it I looked up the three stories that she had given me and they were not even related unlike the white people shooting up black churches like you could say what's related there is white people shooting up black churches i.e a pattern that appears to be racist versus with the catholic church it seemed to be more like the man was personally uh, upset with the priest and shot him or this happened but the reaction of my mother's church was the most interesting thing remember they're in a bubble they're catholic the men of the church decided that they would stand guard against a possible shooter and my dad included they all wore guns and tasers and they would walk around the church and during mass and they would feel very useful and i think that's important and beautiful but i think if anyone ever sat down and really objectively thought about the statistical chances of someone shooting up a Catholic church, especially during that time, it really isn't large enough to create a hoopla, but I can understand why they did it. It made them really feel circularly fulfilled in their bubble. You know, they felt useful spiritually, physically. They were there to provide for people. I mean, there's a lot of positives there. Community, structure, consistency are the three things human beings need to live long, happy lives. And religion obviously encompasses those things. They've done studies. They've done articles. It's always been said. And I think that's why people who are non-religious in particular seek out bubbles to find those things that we desire. I'm sure at this stage, a lot of people started taking their mental health breaks because it's just too much. It's just too much. It's too much for me. I didn't want to see more news channels talking about the thousands of people that coughed out a lung. I didn't want to see more uh, musicians and actors and actresses getting canceled and crucified. It was like, I just want to like kind of res go back to a place of peace you know and uh i think that's normal and for anybody that's like guilt tripping people that for wanting to find peace you're part of the problem i'm sorry to say so at that stage there was a summer out here where everything opened up from the lockdown and uh, a little early i'll say that much and uh, i basically started live streaming what felt like um you know a return to innocence uh i'm getting chills just talking about it because 
we've really lost this innocence collectively. I don't think I'm the only one that feels like this, but I think at a certain point, the, the, the collective consciousness lost our ability to just purely enjoy things without having some sort of poison in, in the well here. So during these, these, this live stream phase of mine, I just like explored this beautiful city of Prague on a unicycle, on an electric unicycle, yes, they exist, and uh, explored the day-to-day -day life, interacting with people in a really friendly manner, eating food, the really normal things. And they were, these live streams were so much fun and I wasn't doing anything crazy, you know? And I think a lot of people had a lot of fun watching it. And looking back, it's like, wow, have things changed with everything? I'm sorry, I just, and I mean this in the nicest way possible. He's right, right? Like innocence is, is not the word I would use. And I don't think there was a time in history where anyone just enjoyed anything. I don't know what world that is, maybe a man's world, but that doesn't sound like a world that I've ever heard about. You know what I mean? My ancestors most certainly didn't just enjoy life in the same way, but they did it th to some extent. Actually, um, walking around, talking to people, living out your daily life. My dad says a lot in Iraq, they would just like spend a lot of time sitting around. I do that now. Like before I went to go do this video, my brother said, come sit outside. It's really nice today because we do spend a lot of our time sitting around with each other. Sometimes in silence, sometimes we're talking. Sometimes I just need a break from work. We all work from home right now. So we're, except for Mark who works at Starbucks, as you guys know. So like we're all here right now you know I live with like four of my siblings <laughs> which is so fun and it's like always high energy in this house but the point is is that there is there was never a time in my existence and throughout history that I've understood where people were just enjoying life like we were surviving this is the first time some of us have had the luxury of just having fun and traveling and meeting people now I always say like you know, people always ask me, you know, do you know, do you have to be rich or poor, educated to be enlightened? Nah. At the end of the day, like poor countries, poor people in general, you know, they have just as much opportunity to socialize and have these moments as like rich people. But functionally speaking, most poor people, myself included, when I was poor, like I'm I'm teacher salary poor right now. But when I was really poor, um, obviously, like I was a person trying to make it in Seattle. You know what I mean? I was working all the time. I didn't I had this version of going out and doing things at like BDSM dungeons and queer events. But those were events orchestrated in a bubble for the people in the bubble. They weren't just random people yet. Now throughout my life, because I'm social, though introverted, I have always met people along the way, talked to random people in the store. I am a person that people come to and talk to me. My farm brother's the same way. No matter where we are, some people will just come up to us and start telling us their life story, showing us photos on their phones. I just take this as a sign that I'm supposed to be here in this moment to like facilitate this interaction with them. They must have needed it for some reason. But that is as innocent as I can think of my past. I now... In retrospect, like if I really had to be honest, now I can enjoy my life in a very, a very profound way that is not innocent. It's actually not innocent, but it is, um, I guess you could say organic, which you could say is pure, which you could say is innocent, which you could say is a lot of things. Maybe I just have the idea of innocence because it makes me feel like naivety, but I feel like knowledge is what actually allows you to be innocent again not ignorance and I feel like Pierre is remembering a time where people were ignorant because 2016 and corona and all these things that we faced opened the lens into all of our bubbles and all of our people especially in the states but around the world who were experiencing discrimination and hardship in a way that people were ignoring so now twos had the opportunity twos most people born into bubbles live in bubbles die in bubbles most people in the world are twos and here they are existing and here they are thriving in their bubbles within the rules of that bubble. Give me a second. My sister's calling. Hey, girl, what's up? Do you have the time to listen to me whine? What's up? Oh, to sit on this line. That's that's clever. I'm actually like filming a video about Pierre right now. Are you really? Yeah, he's he's actually like this video I'm watching of him is so funny. I can't wait to watch the next one to confirm. But he seems like a very three right now. He's talking about the innocent days of like YouTube and past life where people could just enjoy their life. I was like, when, Pierre? When? <laughs> when? Like, he's talking about him individually and people like him. Two hours later. Okay, great. Okay, I love you, sister. I'll talk to you soon. All right, love you. Okay, bye. It's really hard to find an outlet just to do those types of things without people, you know, pressuring you and shaming you for enjoying yourself. <laughs> But a big reason why I ended up kind of diving into this live streaming uh, of 
my external everyday life here, I purposely made it so I would not talk about politics. I would not talk about social problems. I wanted this to be a little Narnia, a little Wonderland, a little Disneyland of life without these things because how much more of this negativity online and in the media can we absorb before we just want to go, you know? So the least I could do for my own sanity and for others is to kind of, you know, at least give a, a little world where everybody didn't have to focus on these things. So that being said, obviously the hysteria did not decline and it didn't stop. I was just kind of turning away from it while everybody in their keyboard warrior-ness started fighting online and canceling each other and doing whatever the hell they are. So that was still going on. And I was really kind of distancing myself from this particular channel, the main channel, because I didn't want to cover these things anymore. It just didn't, didn't feel good. It didn't, you know, it didn't really feel like it was helping or benefiting myself or anyone around me. So I was just kind of like dipping in, dipping out, dipping in, dipping out. And at a certain point, I remember coming back in and releasing a few videos and looking at the comments. And I'm like, what happened? What happened to y'all, man? <laughs> Not everybody, but the comments got more and more divided, more and more polarized. Not in a good, like, everybody's included. It felt like the United Nations type of diversity here, but I was talking about like hashtag MAGA, hashtag BLM, hashtag, it was like I literally had a political war in my comments at one point of people on completely opposite sides of the spectrum. And I'm like, how the hell did this happen? And did I do this? How did I just attract two demographics or three or four or all the demographics of people that just don't even agree with each other. And it wasn't only that, I sensed a tone that was also directed at me. What used to be kind of maybe a, a polite disagreement or maybe a, uh, yeah, Pierre, you've really helped me out type of a thing. I really like your thoughts. It became more of like, Pierre, you piece of shit. You b believe this, you narcissistic trash. You need to educate yourself and blah. <laughs> and that eventually became like a, a majority of the comments, you know, and don't get me wrong. There were still positive comments. At this stage, it was like 75% negativity and 20 5% positive, which at that point was not even fun anymore. At this point, you know, being locked down and only having the internet and then absorbing the the world around me being negative comments like that, plus people dying on the news and cancellations, I couldn't handle maintaining an audience that, f that I felt like hated me. <laughs> and if they didn't hate me, they were ready to because the sensitivity of what was appropriate to talk about or appropriate to say was so narrow that if I would have just explored an idea that I didn't even have to agree with, I was the enemy and I was the big problem here. So there was an immediate aversion to just exploring things or just free thinking in general. And don't even get me started with the actual censorship on the platform. I mean, everybody knows about that. Big tech is just censoring anything that they don't want discussed. So I was like, well, that's all I want to talk about, but I can't. And if I talk about any, even if that wasn't there, my own audience doesn't want to talk about it. So fuck, like, I guess I just won't talk about it. To even to the positive comments, I'm sorry, but I just have to say this honestly, a lot of the positive comments were really superficial uh, and that's fine. You know, I can't, I can't like be angry that like, people think I'm pretty you know, and uh, people think I'm attractive. But at a certain point, when you're putting so much effort to try to, you know, construct nuanced arguments about pretty deep, hard hitting issues, and all you get is Pierre, can I get a makeup tutorial? Oh, you're so pretty. Like, I like your makeup. Oh, Pierre, your face, your hair was much better before. I don't, I was like, what am I doing this? And who am I doing this for? Like, y'all don't even give a fuck up, even though you might post some hashtags and infographics, but you really don't care. So all the positive comments just felt really surface level and I wasn't actually being listened to or heard. Anything I said just slightly wrong, I'd be crucified for. So I was just trying to please a bunch of people with a gun on a firing squad. You know? And it was like, y'all aren't even on my side. And I'm not saying we need to take sides, but y'all don't even like me. 
feel like a, a jester at your corrupt, tyrannical, medieval uh, royal palace, man. My God. Overall, I just got really tired of arguing. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm done with just fighting with people online and debating. It doesn't do anything anymore at this stage. It doesn't do anything for me. He's going through his motions. He's telling you the story. He's getting us up to speed with how he was feeling and what he came to a conclusion of. And I agree. So stop right here. This is like a good three moment. This is when I know like somebody is a three is when they go from debating to discussing. I hit my three stage and then I got invited to be a moderator at MythCon. So here I am at MythCon, a very politicized uh, event. There was basically only a few leftists and I was one of the people representing the left. And at the time we was like Marissa J. Johnson and um, like a non-binary person and like all these other people. And it was like really cool. It was primarily a conference known for being sort of right winged, but I would argue that it was mostly very liberal. Um, traditional Democrat liberal mostly. A lot of those people were like very pro women and men and egalitarianism, but they hung out on the side of YouTube that was mostly like Sargon of Akkad or Tim Pool. I mean, who were both there? And Carl's very nice. I have every, like, I have really nice things to say about Carl Benjamin versus some other people that were there, but I ain't gonna talk shit out loud. Okay, so here I was at this event and it was clear that it was polarized, but it was also clear that people were really warm and welcoming, even if they were very judgy, which is why I really encourage you guys to gay judge, but not really judge because I don't think any of us, for the most part, truly hate people. I think we have very strong responses to people, mostly from trauma or our history or a lack of knowledge, but I don't think we have a lot of hate in our hearts. I think most people are just really misinformed and so they make really bad decisions. But I've been there so I can't judge anyone really because I too have made horrible mistakes, horrible judgments horrible. So I can't even sit there from a pedestal and pretend like I wasn't there. I think I have more empathy and sympathy for the world as I age because I just recognize how foolish I have been for most of my life and how hard it is to really just admit that I was the problem. And I think when you hit four, you really realize like you're a part of it in a way that it's like, Oh my God, because when I was a three guys, I thought I was going to go to MythCon and be really like really equal and really have a discussion, not a debate. It wasn't about winning. It was about introspective and learning. But I was in a room full of twos who just wanted to win and people who just didn't want to lose. And the people who who they were all really cool, like no judgment on anyone who was there except that one person. Oh, there was one person there. I just want to backhand like a bitch. Anyways, that's not the point. The point is that most people who were there were chill and they were chill because they genuinely were just there to kind of enjoy themselves because debate for people is enjoyable. The adrenaline rush. Oof. I get watching a debate versus a discussion had between thinkers. Woohoo! That's why I really like a lot of the um like Cambridge interviews or some of the interviews that happen in literary circles. I will say for all of its shit, academia sometimes does host really good discussions between thinkers and I wish we saw more of that but like Pierre said no matter where you are there is a limitation to what what people want to even hear and I've gone to so many conferences over my life religious non-religious gay queer bisexual all the, bisexual queer why did I say that like it was all different things you know what I'm saying gay things religious things right wing left wing the point is, is that I've been to so many all of them are bubbles. And so long as it is a bubble, that means within the group think there is an objective right answer. And if you have the wrong think, you are bad. So if you are in a bubble, yes, it will always be black and white. That's what bubbles are. <laughs> but when you realize there are bubbles, like I think Pierre is realizing right now, you have an, uh, an opportunity to have actual discussions with people, like real conversations where it, it's, it's, it's really like almost not even about you. You know what I mean? It's about the issue at hand. But if if you're seen as the person who is maybe that issue, it's less of a, a crucifixion when you're in a discussion. It's more of a realization, a comfortability of I'm in a safe space having a discussion with people who even if I'm found out to be the bad guy will not judge me for it, but will help me figure out how not to be. Versus in bubbles where there's debates, there has to be a bad guy and that bad guy has to be the person who gets canceled. I started reaching like the biggest burnout of my life. I think reaching my age to, I'm going through a Saturn return, if you want astrological terms. But uh, this burnout was not just like, I am i can't do work anymore. I can't do YouTube. It was my, my whole identity crushing. Uh, who I used to be and who I thought I needed to be or wanted to be was completely gone. Uh, I felt like even if I did music and art, the whole uh, landscape is so overly saturated. It didn't feel like it was actually doing anything. It felt kind of useless at the time. The audience has a gun to my head. I was like, man, I have to quit what I used to love. This is still, I actually still love it. 
but it feels like with all the circumstances of the world, the people, the audience, or whatever, allowed me to be in a position where it was like, I'm falling down a pit, and I hate it, and I just have to let go, and it felt like a part of me was dying, and I had to grieve, and that's what I did. During this time, things just almost kind of got worse, man. Uh, I'll be honest, what happened was, um, even in real life, uh, I remember the lockdown lifted that spring, and I was just trying to, like, go outside. <laughs> and this whole month, people were erratic as hell. Uh, the, this whole lockdown situation and whatever else has made people really... Uh, let's just say they kind of forgot how to interact with others. This is so interesting. Like, you want to talk about bubbles? So you guys know my COVID quarantine was great because <laughs> I live my life like normal. I live in a state that's just kind of chilling. So I'm really enjoying my time in, in my particular neighborhood. I live in a town of 6,000 people. Everyone's socializing like normal because none of us ever stopped. But in the cities, I'm hearing people are having panic attacks, don't know how to socialize. They're being rude to wait staff, like in an extreme way. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, this is this is the issue. You are so afraid to die from a virus that you're willing to 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 exchange your humanity because you fear dying. And for me, the person I am, fuck death, bro. So easy death. So you cease to exist. Who fucking cares? Who wants to exist your actual existence right now in constant pain under under discrimination and dealing with other people's bullshit and feeling like this? Why is this better? than death that is what i don't understand about too sometimes how is this better than dying how are you willing to go under an immense amount of stress to, to quarantine to avoid death when you could have lived your life like people everyone in my neighborhood did normal seeing their families hanging out everyone did fine one or two people died who had underlining conditions or were old that's normal that's life right that's still sad it's what happens but in general Please compare our joy to yours because I had the greatest two years bonding with my family, relaxing and having fun. The only thing that was inconvenient was any time there were lockdowns or I couldn't go places. We all had COVID. We moved through it. I took care of people who had COVID. We moved through it. Everyone managed. But that doesn't mean that some people who got COVID didn't have extremely horrifying situations. That doesn't mean that Pierre in the city isn't experiencing a real sense of identity lost and watching it spread throughout his community. All of these realities are existing at the same time, which is why when people hear me go, my, my COVID stuff was great. I made the more, most money I've ever made. I got the most success on YouTube I've ever had. A lot of things turned out good for me, right? I met a lot of really cool people, made some good friends. That's because my life and where it is, COVID to me was a walk in the park compared to all the hardships I've experienced in my life. The easiest thing I had to do was avoid an airborne virus. My life has been so much harder than that. But that doesn't mean your life isn't experiencing its hardest time now. Which is why I need you to acknowledge you're in a bubble and you are only experiencing reality the way you understand it. That your lived experience is not everybody's as my lived experience is not everybody's. So even though I am joyful, it doesn't mean people don't suffer. It doesn't mean I have to be aware and have empathy when those people are talking about their hardships. Of course, I feel awful for the people who are impacted by COVID. But to say we all had the same experience is not true, just like it wasn't 10 years ago or 100 years ago or a million years ago. No human being lives the same exact experience. But because humans want to love and be loved and they want to be seen and understood, we all have the same deep rooted desire. And because of that, we often mimic each other to try to find it. And thus, not playing to our strengths, playing to other people's strengths. Oh, I'm Pierre and I'll make controversial videos because that's how other people found success. Instead of finding the success, success he needed in himself, which begins with himself. It does not begin with learning an algorithm or how to, how to beat the algorithm. It starts with your authenticity, who you are, and making sure you're connecting with the right people. Not to brag, not to throw shade, but my audience is perfect. Criticism, conversation, openness, willingness, um, safe space. Like it's awesome. All diverse voices, very interesting, all different walks of life. And yet ultimately, I think we're all seeking the same thing. As I see in all your comments, a desire to do good. So many of you are so angry at me because of my stances on vaccines or whatever else you think I think I believe or whatever you think I think I believe. But I don't blame you. 
Why wouldn't you see me as the enemy when you've been told your whole life how to think? Why, why, why wouldn't you see me that way? I don't blame you. But let me tell you this, boo-boo, I don't think of you as my enemy. And that's the difference. I don't think of people who oppose me as my enemy. I just ask, like, are you literally physically going to get in my way? Or can you hate me from afar? Because if you can hate me from far away, I'm good with you. If you can't and you're going to get in my physical space, then we can have, you know, a talk. But that's the difference. Is before when I was a two, even a three, I wasn't open to cohabitating in the same way that I am now. But I radically accept that the world is diverse. And everyone is discovering things at different times. What if I went to Pierre when he was younger and demanded that he should know what I know? How dare Pierre be at this stage in his life and not know? Now, I'm surprised he doesn't know, right? But at the same time, that's me making the assumption that because he's other, rebellious, different, that maybe he would pop bubbles sooner. But no, this is the moment Pierre is truly popping a bubble. He might have popped the Asian stereotype bubble. He might have popped the feminine boy, pretty boy bubble. He might have popped a lot of bubbles along the way. But obviously, now is the time he is having a real question with himself to the point where he loves YouTube and is still considering what it means to be on the platform and whether he should be here, which I'm going to predict right now he actually never leaves YouTube, that he takes a break, but he ultimately will stay here for another 5, 10, 20, 30 years because this is a place Pierre can thrive. I see it in him. He's so clearly made for it. He's so good at it. His editing is so nice. His aesthetic is beautiful. His pacing is good. How could you not be here? You just have to know how to facilitate your joy in a space that is shared. And that is so difficult because they do not tell you how to do that. No, they cancel you and call you hateful and decide you're a bad person because they're a good person and they wouldn't do what you did. And if they don't do what you do, that must mean we are not the same. And if we are not the same and I am a good person, you must be a bad person. Solid two thinking, guys. Solid two thinking. Okay. People have been a lot more violent, a lot more aggressive especially in a safe city like I live in, it's never happened like this, but I remember one day I literally was wheeling around and this dude, uh, you, you can maybe classify him as a junkie, who knows? He stopped me as I was wheeling and he looked at me and he starts talking to me in check and I talk back. He was thrown back by the deep voice. He starts looking at my Adam's apple and he's like, hello? And then I said, hey, okay, I'll talk to you later. I wheel off to the side, he starts following me. At this stage, what I usually do is yell and cuss a person out because they usually just run away. This time it didn't work. He chased me. It was like a cartoon. It was like some Benny Hill shit. So I'm literally on my unicycle and I go like fucking 30 kilometers an hour and I and he's running full speed like Terminator, the liquid man, you know, and uh, I get around the corner and uh, I run away. And that was kind of traumatizing, I'm not gonna lie. My safety felt really challenged at the moment and I'll just briefly go through this, but I can make other videos on this if you guys wanna know, but I got my leg bit by a dog in the same month. Uh, there were people really actually getting in my face. All right, hey, hey, you can say it in English. Come on, hey, hey, hey! Uh, security. Okay, okay, so the first guy chased him, and that was scary. That sounds really scary. I don't like that. But the second guy who on the street, just like the fatter guy, who like yelled at you or said something to you, and then you like, what, what? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Why would you do that? Why would you engage? Because you're a man. Because you're a, I don't know. Why, why? Like, why else? Like, I don't even know what, my brain would just been like, no, it depends. I have engaged. Okay, let me rephrase. Sorry, maybe I should rethink this. Because I have engaged, but I've never complained about it. I've always wore it as a sign of honor. Like people, oh my God. Okay, hold on. I'm a woman. <laughs> and so my whole life, men have followed me. Men have taken my no and ignored it. I have been assaulted. But men have also been courteous. Like for every bad man I met, there was like 10 good ones, okay? So one in 10, let's say, or shitty. So they're, that's still pretty high though. But is you know, is it was this. I am so used to it that I know when I engage that I'm engaging, you know, as like the top. When you tell this story and it's okay, the answer, what I'm hearing is that you're upset that someone berated you and you attack them back, which is weird because when I'm afraid, I would never engage. It's only when I feel safe enough to engage that I do, which means I feel like, oh, I'm about to win this. They fucked with the wrong person today. 
But in the way you tell the story, in the way that I'm hearing it, I'm hearing that you're upset that you were engaged with to begin with. And yes, that is the upsetting part. But why then would you engage back when he was just probably having a bad day and walked past you and said something? Like, that's what I don't understand. Now, again, maybe he edited the video and the context of it is missing for me. But I'm saying different kinds of people handle things differently because they can read a person's language. I don't take it personal that people follow me or that people want something from me because I have to assume that if you're willing to engage with a stranger in public, there's something more happening than just the service level. Oh, this is a person interacting with the world. People don't just do these things. In general, depending on where you live, most people are functionally socializing and interacting and sharing space together. You know what I mean? And if you live in an area where that's not true, that's specific to your bubble. And that's important. And karma, like Sadhguru says, it's a reflection of your life. And you make choices to wake up every day in a specific environment, unless you are literally a child. We know when we know there's more out there. We know. But to know there's more out there, you have to find out and you have to discover. So it's almost like when you're in a bubble, and that's why stews, twos mostly stay there, is you have to be willing to leave your bubble and truly experience a life-changing moment that could cause you to question your whole existence and what it means to be a person. And so in order to do that, Pierre in that moment would have had to have the wisdom to quickly, in ten, two seconds, two seconds, say, is this guy going to threaten me? What is he doing here? What does he need? What does his body language say? I feel like I do that all the time and I think it's because I'm a woman. I think as a woman, at least the person that I am, also introspective and I watch people like a hawk, I am always aware that somebody could kill me. Always. And maybe because, I don't know, it's just my, maybe the environment I was raised in. But my brothers and I, when we go to restaurants, like we sit with our backs to the wall so we can see the door. We're very specifically protective of each other. We have like paranoid like what we what should we do if there's a shooter in our church like plans that we make or in our house or in our mall like what do we do like we all have plans for all of these emergencies because we know they're possible but we're probably never going to experience them in our lifetime because of the way we live we live in small towns we purposely don't hang out in large crowds we enjoy life to the best of our ability maybe go to disneyland on occasion that's a pretty large crowd but in general we just kind of like live a really chill relaxed beautiful you know just like a life just like a farm life. All of this is bubbles. The way he treated this man was just as fucked up as the man treated him. Because honestly, when angry people engage with you in public, they're probably not reasonable and you should walk away. Do you get what I'm saying? Everyone's imagining it's a normally sane person interacting this way. But you and I are sane in a way that we would never. So you have to assume they're kind of like living in a reality where this is okay in any way which means we are not living in the same reality. Yelling at people in public, engaging in this way. I don't mean to repeat myself, but I really want to make this clear. There's so much nuance to be had here and how you react is key. That is the key difference between twos and threes and fours and fives. Threes know there are better ways to react, but they might not be able to do it. Fours and fives just automatically react better. Fours might still get upset, but they might engage way calmer than a three could. And a, and a five would literally just be like, hey, dude, I don't know what's going on. I hope you have a good day, but I'm not engaging with this piece. Or we would walk away or do what's reasonable. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying Pierre is unreasonable. I just really wanted to add context into that. I'm so sorry I ranted, but it, I needed to say it. Uh, there were so many events that were challenging my actual physical safety and my mental safety. Uh, so what I did was like, dude, I have lost my platform. I've lost, I don't feel like my, I can trust my audience. I don't think they can trust me. I'm losing that. I'm getting chased by dogs. Junkies chasing me. Security guards kicking me. Some racial comments. People harassing me. Bruh, I, sh I basically shaved my head. I didn't shave my head. I cut my hair to a point where it was really uncomfortable for me. And I started wearing a lot less makeup. A lot less. Because I just did not want to be seen. I wanted to hide. I did not want to be noticed anymore because like, Jesus, I, that was too much to happen in one month. Really fast. I'm so sorry to be a bitch and interrupt every five seconds. But you know what? You come to hear my opinion. You know what I'm saying? So listen to me. This is what I'm saying. This is so valid. What's happening to him is sucky. 
And it's not fair. And it's fucked up. And I hate the idea that he spooked. Or I hate the idea he worried for his physical safety. I hate the idea that he had to ass ass assimilate more into the culture that he was existing in to, to not get harassed. I hate that. But this is a great example of why bubbles do exist. And shared realities. Like we should be talking about how much we actually overlap with how we view the world. Because everything he's explaining right now in this story is just a everyday woman's experience. For the most part. Every woman I've talked to has exactly this, this story. You know what I mean? And that is our reality. And so I think in some ways Pierre is recognizing that, oh my gosh, like I'm afraid for the first time in my life. And that is a really scary feeling. I, I'm not really sure what it would be like to recognize that later in life, except that I have through, you know, my one-on-one -on -one calls and stuff, been talking to a lot of humans who are also experiencing this for the first time in their late 20s, 30s, 40s. And I want you to know it is common because it's happening and it's happening in droves. I'm seeing it. And I, I often assume people who are like queer or other or dressed like Pierre that they've gone through it in the same way I did at the same timeline. But of course they haven't, right? Of course Pierre maybe wouldn't have known what strange objectification looked like in public unless he was a person who embodied a specific um, desire of the populace. Like obviously, it's just uh, I feel I feel for him so much right now. I wonder as a man how scary that feels to feel so vulnerable. Um, I know men f do experience this. Um, it sounds like Piers is a little bit unique, but maybe not. And I know men in my audience have definitely experienced it. So please share your stories down in the comment sections below. We definitely are like an open space for stories, you know, and do not go around fighting each other in the comments. That's no fun. Try to, for a moment, pause and say, I wonder how I feel about this person's perspective. And if it is authentic through their lens, how does that coincide with my beliefs? And then how does that make me debate with myself the difference between what I believe and what I know, right? Because the levels is trying to help you understand that like you know so much and you believe so much and you really got to know the difference between the two. So you aren't always in conflict with the world, you know, so you can find peace and joy in the place you exist. A spiritual text, uh, you know, monks shave their head to release their ego and to kind of start all over. I didn't necessarily shave my head and didn't reach to that extent, but it did feel like an ego death after especially I cut my hair and got rid of the makeup. That that was my physical identity, especially online and who I really was for years. And then getting rid of that was really scary. It was frightening, it was heavy, but also a little liberating at the same time. But of course, my own audience started losing interest. All the ones that are like, I love your thoughts, Pierre, your philosophical ideas, they're amazing. I never thought about it like that. Unfollow, you don't have- Sorry, 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 sorry. But as you guys know, I also went on a similar journey with my look. And as a woman, I did shave my head. I did everything I had to do to make sure that I felt comfortable being masculine, feminine, in my body, outside my body. I got nude. I learned how to get nude in public. I learned how to be comfortable naked. So if God forbid I'm ever in any situation where I'm naked in bed and then somebody robs my house, I can fight them naked. But you know what I'm saying? I did things to purposely push myself and I've been doing this since I was about eight. Yeah, maybe even younger. Like I've been so self-aware and yet I was a two for most of my life. I lived in a bubble for most of my life. I didn't reach three until what my mid late 20s. And then I was a four, you know, near 30, basically 30. And then the last two years, I basically constitute myself as a five. But it took me so long. And then it took me time to get comfortable in that. This is such an important lesson. Take from Pierre and listen to him. Go experiment and challenge yourself. Very important to not fear losing yourself. The truth is, is if Pierre disappeared for three years and then came back to the internet, he'd be fine. Just like Dave Chappelle, just like anyone else in the world who's ever disappeared for a time and come back. I hate to say it, but no one person is that important. There are so many celebrities right now who have disappeared from the world and the world hasn't stopped. But when you're in a two bubble, you become invested in life being consistent in a way that it just never is, which is why it's always so shocking when your life changes, which is why ego deaths, in my opinion, have to be the humbling of the self enough that you actually do change as a person after each one. And then I think you can have many ego deaths in life. And then I think you could still end up a two, which is, I think, hard for people to understand. But I think not all people go to the length that I think people like I've decided to do or other people because I, I think you have to be very willing to to dissolve yourself of the world, to give it all up. 
And I think until you're ready for that, you just, you won't. And I wonder about Pierre, because he still sounds afraid to me. And that's very fair. You know, it's really fair. No makeup, no follow. No hair, no follow. So I started losing a, quite a bit of attention at that point, but I didn't care at the moment because I felt like the platform was already dead. Uh, I remember I was trying to, oh, was so sad. I was trying to tease my hair with a comb in the mirror. So I'm looking at the mirror, teasing it. I close my eyes. I'm not even joking. An image of a burning village came in my mind. Like I, I just visualized a burning village, a straw hut almost. I just broke down. I started crying. I started like, I just, I felt like I lost like my home. You know, I lost like something that was, I cared about so much. The people that lived in the village, the village itself, the everything I, I, I worked to build that village, like all of it was burned alive and, and gone. And obviously that's a really dramatic thought. <laughs> But at the moment, that's, I mean, I can't tell you otherwise. That's what I saw and that's what I felt. And I remember I started watching some martial arts film called Ong Bak with Tony Ja. And I don't know why. I, oh, because uh, a junkie chased me on the street. And I was like, maybe I should just learn to like some self-defense just to like kind of like be feel more confident about it. So I watched a clip from this movie. And basically the, the villain, uh, kidnaps Tony Jaw's elephants. And in Thailand, elephants are regarded as one of the holiest creatures ever. And Tony finds him and he's like, where are my elephants, man? You know, not like that, but like, where are they? The villain literally throws a decapitated elephant trunk at him. They're in a restaurant, everybody's eating elephant soup. It's dark. That's how it feels on social media. It felt at that moment, like my elephants were kidnapped, they were slaughtered, and everybody around just eating their goddamn social media elephant soup, just enjoying every second of it. And I broke down. I broke down again. I just, man, I was really, really, really going through some, a really, really hard time. I booked a trip to Santorini. Let's just say I live streamed an entire breakdown there. It wasn't good. Uh, you can't escape yourself when you travel, and there was a lot of problems on that trip. <laughs> And uh, I hated a lot of it. I did not have a good time in Santorini, and it just broke me down even further to nothingness. This is the worst fucking vacation. After the Santorini experience, at that stage of, let's just say, complete nothingness, the rubble from the demolition, uh, the after explosion, I landed back in the city, this beautiful city of Prague. And I just remember walking through the passport check and I give the biggest nobody den the smile of just being at my soul home. And the guy doesn't even check my passport. He's like, you belong here, come in. And he just looks at it, just, he doesn't even look at it. He just opens the gate for me. And I felt like I was at home. Everybody around was being super nice and I kind of really started realizing the value of human connection, the importance of being around yourself and others that really care for you and learning to care for yourself. I was getting into a more simple approach to life, a physical life. And it sounds weird because it's like everything has been physical until the last 30 years. Things got better because I saw how bad it can really be. And I started, you know, regaining a whole new appreciation for life, connection, um, and other people. You know, at this current stage, I was like, you know what? I got to start doing things. You know, I got to maybe take a few classes. I got to get my life together. I got to figure something out. I felt like I was able to handle things more instead of like seeing stuff around the world and all these bad things happening around me and my people and whoever else. I was like, oh shit, now that I'm doing this, I don't feel like I'm helpless. I feel like I actually have a bit of power in my own agency and my own individuality to, to stand up for myself mentally, spiritually, and physically just through this one practice. One part that I forgot to say during that movie was when Tony Jaw saw the elephant trunk and the people eating the elephant soup, all he did was fight his way out of it. It's depicted physically in the movie, obviously, but there's a really big metaphor here. There's a very big spiritual component to this. At this stage of the world and what everyone's going through right now, the only option 
that we have is either let it swallow us alive or we just fight. And it doesn't mean actually throw a jab. It doesn't mean actually hit somebody, but we have to fight through our own restrictions. We have to fight through what is restricting us from being our best potential. We can't let this demoralization and, you know, this helplessness be the, the victimization, be the main narrative of how we live our lives. It's not, it's just, it's actually even harder than fighting back. You're not going to be happy following that path. It's not easier. The only thing that we can do is fight through it. The only way is through, not away. While I was finding a new sense of empowerment and passion and livelihood in my own soul, I had to see what I call the great unfollowing. The great unfollowing is basically what, what happens when <laughs> you become more of yourself and you find what really is you. And what happens around you is that people start to leave. Now, most of this in my case was digital. The more I just I decided to just to post some boxing clips. I was getting really into boxing and learning Muay Thai on my own. Didn't post anything about it for two months. It was like a dirty little secret that I had in my heart. And I came out of the martial arts closet. I just posted some Instagram stories of me boxing. And it wasn't like I was yelling at anybody or saying anything problematic. But I, I immediately saw hundreds of people unfollowing. And I tried it again. I posted more boxing clips, more people unfollowing. I'm talking about hundreds. Hundreds of more people started unfollowing the more boxing clips I posted. It got to a certain point where I was like, is it this fragile, this online world, but let alone relationships with people where you do something that you actually love that they might not agree or it's outside of their own projections of you and that's enough for them to leave? and to not like you or to lose their connection, I guess that is now. Our connections with each other are so sensitive and so fragile that practically anything can sever that. So if there are people that are willing to stick by regardless of the changes, those, those people are important and those are the people that you should fight for. But regardless, I was just in shock with how many people started unfollowing because of just boxing clips. So I'm at this stage, I'm like, whatever, I'm only gonna post boxing clips. <laughs> I started just basically diving deeper and deeper and deeper into boxing, martial arts, Muay Thai, and all of these things because it gave me my soul back. And I really feel more like myself because all of this. And it's in exchange for the great unfollowing. Sure, having all of these people unfollow for a platform you've built over the years and seeing this grand tower and castle that you've spent your blood, sweat, and tears to make... It's really sad seeing that whole thing crumble and it's sad to see people go. But what I get in return is my own sanity, my sense of self and a sense of competence and strength. And that's something that no amount of followers or no amount of money and no amount of fame or all these things could ever buy you. Most importantly, even though there's this great unfollowing and all of the breakdowns and all of this stuff that occurred, in the end, the most important thing was this new found sense of freedom and liberation. This is something that is priceless. You can't put a price on liberation. And honestly, at this stage, I don't really regret going through anything that I went through. It's basically allowed me to become more of me. And I can only hope that no matter what happens in your life or what's happening around the world, you can find a way to be more of you. Because the truth is, we probably will never find the answer to the world's problems and a, a direct solution to what's already happening around the world. And as much as we want to save everyone around us and save this and save that, perhaps the only thing that we can do is save ourselves. I actually believe we can. That being said, if you made it this far in the video, I just want to say thank you for that. It's been quite long, but I also haven't posted in months and months and months. I hope to see you guys soon. As for the channel, I really have no idea what to do with this main channel. I don't know. Perhaps I'll post more motivational, philosophical stuff, but I will say there's only so much drama I could ever handle again. Perhaps a bit of discussions on a controversial issue maybe maybe not definitely done with the drama stuff 
So in the end, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I don't know where this channel will go. I don't know where I'll go exactly, but I can only say we can just wait and see. But then though, it's your multidimensional flip lord, Pierre XO. Okay, I have to put this video on pause. I have to go do a call and then I'll come back and finish it. Two hours later. Welcome back. You might hear people yelling in the background. My brothers are having a smash competition. That's not a sexual, it's a Smash Bros competition. And I just finished a call. I'm going to record with you guys and then I'm going to go back to my call. But I want to get this video seen with you. Um, right now, just like take a break. Let's take a break. For people on the internet, we do not know Pierre. I think in conjunction with that, I think it's really important that I just make it clear that I am not a god. And that I could be making mistakes in this like observation. But from my perspective, I think he's a really good example of a three who goes back to being a two or maybe, you know, totes the line of threeness all the same. But his answers for things at the end of this video, at least, and this was two months ago, is very much like maybe humans will do this. Maybe they won't. We have to save ourselves. Very reasonable and very important for like the two journey. Remember how I say like twos and fives have to go through the same journey of becoming a whole human being, you know, knowing who they are in the anime being mentally, physically, spiritually, um, you know, mentally healthy, going through this journey has to be done by both. But twos have a cap. And right now he feels like he's found his flow in that world. And he feels like he's back home. And I think that's perspective. He went from one place and to another and then had a perception change. He worked on himself. That is beautiful. But nowhere in that video did he really talk about anyone but himself in a real way he by the proxy of who he is and I think a lot of YouTubers are like this he loves his audience in a way that he wants to love his audience as the community in a healthy way that it could be and mourns the loss of the audience he had which is weird because if the audience he had before was toxic why are you mourning toxicity because it's a reflection of the success you had that's two thinking that's fine not a big deal but if he was going to four thinking he'd be like oh my gosh None of it even mattered in the first place. Does it matter if you have a million subscribers or 20? You know, does John Verveke sit here and go, oh, if I only had more subscribers? No, he's busy literally discovering existence and in, in exploring it for what it is. You know, he's not busy worrying about the thing he built because the thing he built, he knows is ultimately not as important as the thing he's doing now. And so I think Pierre is sort of in the cycle still. What he's explaining is difficult. It's really overcoming your trauma, moving past yourself, growing in who you are. And it, it, it takes um, different forms. But for most of us, it's like a radical thing has to happen. And for Pierre, I think it did. I really wanted him to speak to get context for his change in life. And I think it's clear he's still in a bubble, living in a bubble. But this is why it's not a bad thing. Because no one is obligated to leave their bubble. Like I said with Billie Eilish being a two, she's an amazing person who's accomplished amazing things, but only in regards to herself. Fiveness is in regards to existing, the self, and existence, everything around us. It's not just accepting it or looking at it and going, yeah, I guess people are different. It's radically accepting that <laughs> every single thing about our world is in so many ways just people attempting to do, the, to do their best. And that I think is a much harder truth to swallow than everyone just sucks. But you can live as a two with a contentedness around that idea. Well, everyone just sucks. Sure, go have fun thinking the world is that way while still thinking your bubble is better than everyone else's when in reality, we're all the same. You know, there's slight differences. Obviously, you can talk about morals and ethics and all these things. But in general, because I think the human condition is predicated on this want and desire to love, be loved and be seen... That, I don't think anything's wrong with that, you know? Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this video. It's called The Disturbing Thing That YouTube and Social Media Has Become. And the, the thumbnail says, it's over. Very dramatic, Pierre. Very clickbaity. At this stage of the world and what everyone's going through right now, the only option, we have to fight through what is restricting us from being our best potential. The only way is through, not away. What I get in return is my own sanity, my sense of self, and a sense of competence and strength. In the end... The most important thing was this new found sense of freedom and liberation. This is something that is priceless. You can't put a price on liberation. XO is waking up. Wake up to this.
of Fliptopia. And I am your host, Anchor Blazer. Here at Fliptopia News, we like to present opinion and entertainment in the form of undeniable indignant truth. Not too long ago, district therapist by the name of Cancelar Disloyal was found shot on a rooftop near a local booty burger. <laughs> Although there was a witness present, and we have surveillance systems all around every corner of Fliptopia that watches you every minute and every second of the day probably still is a fuck boy. Your host, Anchor Blazer. I hope you enjoy our next episode of Go Flip Yourself. That being said, Blazer out. There was actually a moment in time when I woke up, I wanted to see hundreds and hundreds of notifications. The reason why? I'm not really sure, but I don't think it was just because I liked the sensation of the vibrations like some people would. But like anybody else, what I used to do, I wake up in the morning and I check my phone for an hour or so. And in that time period, I thought getting seen by thousands of strangers in cyberspace was going to be something that could fulfill the void of something deeper. What that void is, I'm not sure what it was. Maybe it was loneliness, it was isolation, but something was missing. And I hoped that having a ton of DMs and messages and comments could possibly fulfill that void. But if anything, all it did was distract. Because the irony is, I got those notifications. I had hundreds of messages and DMs and likes and whatever else that comes with it. And it was great for a while. It's kind of like a roller coaster at a theme park. Except, how much longer can you really stay on a roller coaster before you just sit back and vomit everything back out? Because don't get me wrong, roller coasters are really fun. Theme parks are a blast, but a theme park is not reality, and roller coasters are only fun for a minute at a time, if not 30 seconds. There's fear, there's excitement, there's a release of anger, there's happiness, there's joy, and there's catharsis that comes with it. But you stay on long enough and you'll pay the price, and the price is not pretty. When you're seen by thousands of strangers on the internet, it doesn't matter if you're a so-called influencer or a celebrity, because everybody is an influencer and a celebrity just in a smaller sense. Everyone has a platform these days because anytime you comment something or you post something on the internet or hell, if you consume content, you're hearing another person's thoughts and opinions. You're reading hundreds and hundreds of other strangers' thoughts and opinions as well. And these things just don't disappear. They seep down in your subconscious and it takes over slowly over your mind, body, and soul. Whether it's obvious negative criticism and trolls insulting you for who you are, even the positive comments can also do that, and even the neutral ones. Because in the end, you start living in this weird, boiling, understated paranoia, knowing that eyeballs are on you, watching your every move. Some of them might love you, some of them might hate you, some of them might just not care, but you're being watched. And you don't know who you're being watched by, but I will say, that will definitely change your behavior. Just knowing that in the back of your mind, because that's what's happened to me. I started living life feeling like eyeballs were always on me. And it was voluntary. I started filming myself and streaming myself on a day-to-day -day basis, just hoping that more and more people would interact with what I had to put out. Is that a good thing? You are basically under the projection, or shall I say spell, of thousands of others that don't really know you. You are almost forced to live out their projections, or shall I say even delusions of who you are, to the point where their projections and delusions overpower your own identity as a person. 
You might start interacting or dressing like or editing your videos and photos like the person that they want you to see, the person that you want them to see. So then after a while, you're brought with the question, who am I really? I didn't even know who I was without the roller coaster. And I'm still trying to figure that out. But what really helped was a practice. A practice that I found that allowed me to put myself back in my body. Because when you interact with this AI, this cyberspace, this digital world, you are disassociating, you are dividing your mind from your body. And we as humans are still fairly primitive. It's only when our mind detaches from our bodies when we start feeling insane. And that's all this internet world really does to us. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of benefits as well, but with the current climate of how everything's been going, all it does is detach ourselves from who we are more and more. Ironically enough, this practice that I've been getting into has allowed me to feel back more in my body, except I found it through technology, through virtual reality, through the internet. So it makes me think, is this just another trap for me to get on another roller coaster that distances me from myself? Or is it really something that's allowed me and to simplify existence to a point where I actually feel sane again? Because when I do this every single day, I don't really need all of the extra noise. The noise doesn't really mean anything anymore. All that matters is the present moment. So now I guess there's the decision to be made. How do we interact with cyberspace? How do we interact with technology and this AI that permeates everyone's existence daily. Who knows? I guess only time can tell. Well, that was cute. However, they're after you now. And you only have a few choices here. You either continue fueling their empire with more drama and controversy for an audience that's ready to turn on you at any moment. Or you continue abandoning our village that once was. And lastly, you can come with me, Anti-Dagger. And to be honest, I'm not really leaving much choice. What did you guys think about that? Why don't you guys give initial thoughts and comments after seeing? So Pierre went from two months ago making the video that we just reviewed, the long one, and then this now new short film, which is amazingly done, really good editing, like very impressed. Everything was on point. Uh, visual, everything, music was really good. How, what do you guys think? Like, you know the levels. You've seen my work. You've you've been here for it. You've seen me do tons of other people. Let's let's like make this interactive. If you saw in conjunction with this longer video, this video, is this what I've been describing to you all these months? Is this sensation that Pierre is, is expressing to you, does it feel like the same energy that I'm explaining that I claim to have, that John Verveke has, that other thinkers have, that I've introduced Yadorowski and all these other people that I've claimed are fives, do they hold the same energy? I think the universe does work in crazy ways sometimes, even though I don't believe in like the literal sense of a god or any real universal power. I think that life is crazy interesting. And I had been exploring YouTube and trying to find like a perfect example of a three or a perfect example of a three who becomes a two. And I didn't know it was gonna be Pierre. I am so impressed with the life that he's created for himself and I'm so impressed he's on this journey. It is so clear to me in the way that he conveys his feelings and emotions that he is still living in what I believe is a two world functionally, but I think he's probably like a three brain, like a two, three brain that is trying to communicate to other people this thing he's discovered. And it's beautiful and powerful, and necessary and important, which is why you guys know I'm pro-activism in the sense that I think it's important to make a statement about your existence. I'm pro-meditation. I'm pro-isolation. I'm pro-anything that makes the individual reach their inner joy, whether that is as a two or a five. 
So Pierre going on a journey of introspection and creating a piece of art that is so his, it's him. He obviously is destined for YouTube. He loves it so much. And the idea that he thinks he has to get off of it is something that I hope he, well, I think it's clear in this video, he's kind of moving past. He really has a mission, he believes in this mission. He has a belief. He's passionate about this belief. He has a vision. It is so clear. But it is also clear to me that Pierre and I are having completely di different conversations about the levels of introspection and what we've explored. In my opinion, watching this, I enjoyed it. It's good. When I say this, I need people to understand that this is not shade. Regardless of how beautifully it was produced, it feels like the Bo Burnham special to me. I uh, I also would never have finished the Bo Burnham special if I wasn't going to talk about it on YouTube. For me, Bo Burnham is exploring a very two, a very two awakening, a very two understanding of the world, which is valid, but only within his bubble. And so it's limited in terms of how I can relate to it. Um, also because it's so far from me. This existential crisis that Bo Burnham was having, I had in my early 20s. You know, I'm 32 now. It hasn't been too long, but it's been really long in terms of like the journey up uh, here. I, I feel like I think you guys might have remembered um, America is a white supremacist government, Black Lives Matter. I can see everyone for what they're doing. Three Britney. This is like Pierre's, I think. I think his awareness of the quote unquote games being played is a little bit more than like Reddit conspiracy theorists that call themselves red pills. But I also think it is also only in relation to the world around him. So Pierre, I think, is still operating in a belief system that what he just showed in that video, it to me says that he is more than aware that there is something happening, but he doesn't know what it is. He used really sensational, sensationalized imaging. He used really like sensationalized, sensationalized music. He wanted to evoke a certain emotion. He talked with a certain tone and cancer. He, he purposely orchestrated an image to present to you while ironically presenting the truth or the um, the idea that he was going to take away the curtain, which is sort of like true, but not true, depending on how or why he's doing what he's doing. Who knows? Maybe he's a really introspective five who's like going to pull the wool over all of our eyes. Maybe he's playing chess and I'm playing checkers. But from my observation, if this is authentic and there's nothing around the corner, like truly nothing outside of this talking point, then to me, this video is a talking point bubble of the twos. I love visiting this bubble. I like talking to this bubble, but it's a bubble that does think there's like a, a greater power at play here when really it's just people being people. Humans are going to human. It doesn't mean you have to radically accept what's happening around you. It means you have to radically accept that it's really happening because people are just people. There's nothing mysterious about it. And I didn't hear any of that from him. I heard it's bigger than life. It's very powerful. It's very insane. But I'm not so sure it is. In contrast to Pierre, there's a YouTuber named JReg who I really like. And I, you know, I've spoken to JReg. He's a really nice person. And one of the things about JReg that stands out to me um, is that he, I think, is like an org, like a three, four on his way to the five, like process because his videos, though sensationalized and overproduced and really, really satirical. So you have to really just like the meta, the meta, the meta is, is that there is a, um, there is a sharpness to JREG's work, much like Sneeko's, that doesn't exist in Pierre's. Pierre is, he's, he's bitter because his bubble isn't what he wants it to be. He's not bitter because the world isn't what he wants it to be. And he still thinks he can save the world from my understanding of this video. Again, I could be wrong. He could be, you know, you know, up, something up his sleeve right now. Okay. But I, I'm taking away that he is having an awakening of the self and only the self and hasn't yet had that relationship conversation with himself about, okay, well, now what? Now what after? Because I think his solution is going to be to help his YouTube audience, quote unquote, get a hold of themselves in relation to social media, much like that uh, a documentary that came out about algorithms and Facebook and stuff. This, the network, with the, what was it called? I don't know. I remember what it was called. I liked it. I thought it was really good. It is what's happening, but it isn't what's happening. The movie and the documentary and much like Pierre's the short film here, they make it sound like there is a literal conspiracy happening, like the Illuminati is real somehow, but it's not really that. It is that, but it's not that. That's like saying the mafia is the Illuminati. The Illuminati is just a different mafia, but like organized crime has literally existed forever. So pretending like we're in this crazy time with the internet and it's all so unique, 
is just ignoring the history of our ancestors. I don't think anything that happen- that is happening now is new, except our technology is new. So whether or not we as a species live long enough to see the, um, I guess... <laughs> I don't know, benefits or consequences of this technology. I don't know. Maybe the planet will die. Maybe we'll die. Maybe Brad will fall asleep drunk and hit the nuke button. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But it is so much, like life is so much more than bitterness towards your bubbles. Life is so much more than the internet, but it's even so much more than that. And it is simple. The answer to life is simple. To love, to love and be loved, to be seen and understood, to, to, to see and understand. And there is a depth to that. We all reach different depths. And we all have different conversations and relationships with that. And so I think for me, observing Pierre, great example of a three, two, three who decides to be a two. I think he's probably like a three who's trying to help the twos, which I've been there myself. You know, it's a process, but he's going to have to make a decision whether or not he wants to outgrow even the illusion of his recent discovery, which is is real but not if he really believes he's gonna go and fight the illuminati it's kind of like at the end of squid games when four six five five four five six whatever his name is kind of like we think he's gonna get on the plane and go see his daughter but like turns around and gets back into the squid games you're like what the fuck so i don't know if pierre is really getting out of the squid game but as of right now it kind of seems like he thinks he's gonna go in and fight it and destroy it which is not gonna happen (laughs) but it's a nice plan And it does happen on a smaller scale, just not in the way this grandiose version of it looks in movies and in video games and in this video Pierre made. If you feel like you identify with Pierre, if you feel like this has been your journey and this is your version of how you feel about the bubbles, talk to me about it. This is an open conversation. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great day. Bye. My brother just told me to come sit outside. It's really nice. (laughs) Rip, I can't. I'm working. (laughs) But soon. We also went to the gym today, so I feel like my skin is super shiny and oily and I'm so sorry I did not shower before I made this video. Stuck in my head, in real life while in bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool